Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Um, je m'appelle Vini Mandrikov, uh, mon collègue Nicolas Perrault. Um, Excusez-moi, je suis en russe. Uh, Ce n'est pas très difficile, mais difficile pour moi de parler en français. Alors, uh, nous continuons. En anglais. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. 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 Je suis désolé. So, welcome to the most international session of Breast Camp. <laughs> Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, parsing of uh, languages, of programming mm -hmm. languages. Uh, why we are going to talk about this? Uh, we work at uh, Sonar Source uh, Company, which uh, produces software for uh, quality analysis of other software. And in order to do this, of course, we need uh, to understand uh, source code, so first step is to parse it. Um, so, you know, so, in fact, uh, to explain a little bit, we, we develop our analyzers for languages, so as they've been told, we have to understand the languages. We started as a, as a the, the platform started as an aggregator of other tools, like uh, for Java, for instance, it was like an uh, aggregator for PMD, Textile, PineBug, and so on. Uh, And uh, but at one point, we wanted to cover many more languages. And for instance, we wanted to cover COBOL or other languages like Tatap also. And well, we have existing uh, we have existing Java parsers. Uh, we have Java and so on. But uh, I don't think we know some some COBOL compilers. So that's pretty hard to actually. Use plug ourselves to, to, to non existing compilers. So, uh, so that's why we, we had to somehow develop uh, the technology to, to parse things and, and get into, the, into this parsing of the, 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 the amount of parsing. Yeah. In fact, uh, at the time when uh, we started, uh, compilers were not that, uh, let's say, mature in providing some services as today. Today you can find, okay, some APIs in Java, some APIs in Roslyn for C Sharp, uh, but uh, not at the time when we started. And uh, as I was saying, obviously there is nothing uh, still today for Cobol. Um, also, uh, okay, so what will be our plan for today? Uh, We are going to talk about uh, why the uh, majority of uh, parsers are handwritten, why they don't use uh, some parser generators, and uh, why we use parser generators. Um, we are going to, uh, to talk about all this because uh, many people think that uh, parsing is a soft task and it's super easy. Whereas on practice uh, it is not, and uh, we are going to show why. Um, we have a little uh, coding ex we had a little coding exercise uh, for job applicants at Sonar Source to write a simple uh, calculator for arithmetic expressions, and as practice shows, uh, this is not at all the easiest many people think. Uh, so today we are going to implement uh, such calculator quickly. Uh, we are going to see how, uh, let's say, Java or how we can implement uh, parser for Java. And as a bonus, really quickly, we are going to cover uh, C++, the most complex language uh, for parser. But we are going to do this today. Okay. So, uh, Nicola. Maybe you want yeah, to come out parser? Okay. Parser, as was said, cover task, easy. So I want, to create, I want to create a parser. So Java, let's take the example of Java. I have GLS. There is formal grammar like in, in language specification. Great. I can use some of the tools that use some grammar. Okay, that's good. That should be uh, that shouldn't be too much of an issue, right? Yes, yeah, so plenty of tools, well-known ones. Well, in fact, there's some trouble already. Because, well, I take a look at the GLS, then I have two, two grammars in GLS 7, then one of, the, uh, one of these grammar is gone in GLS 8, and then when I look at uh, some project in GDK, I have 
uh, a parser generator for Java that was abandoned. And if I look at the code of GBK, they have handwritten parser. So why don't they use some other tools? But, well, in fact, it's not that easy. It's really fuzzy. There is a lot of information here. Uh, what, what should I know first to, to start GBK? OK. You probably already know the answer. But no, let's be serious. Um, let's start with a little theory about uh, formal grammars, which you can find, as was said, uh, in many language specifications. Um, those grammars, they describe language. And in those grammars, you will find uh, what is called productions. They, uh, it's, let's say, they're in the form of uh, equations or something similar to equations. On the left-hand side, you have uh, what is called non-terminals. On the right-hand side, you have a mix of uh, non-terminals uh, or, uh, let's say, uh, tokens. Uh, uh, sorry. On right-hand side, you have a mix of terminals and non-terminals. Terminals, we are going to uh, interchangeably call them tokens. Uh, the basic constructions coming out of uh, lexical analyzer, which splits uh, input text on, on those tokens. Uh, also, you can find uh, rules which, uh, which format not just from one production, they format from multiple productions. Those are called alternatives. And uh, what uh, the grammar is, grammar is uh, uh, basically the way to build constructions uh, of uh, a language. Uh, you don't start as uh, in compilers or as in parsers from a text. You actually start uh, from a root grammar rule. Uh, you see uh, into what it can expand. Uh, you, let's say, you flip a coin, you choose one of alternatives, you take these alternatives and you continue expansion process till you get rid of all non-terminals and at the end you will have on the terminals, on the tokens, you will see the, the text which is a valid uh, construction of this language. And work of parsers uh, and what is done by compiler is kind of opposite. Uh, you have a text, then you need to to build uh, uh, the tree which represents mm -hmm. how this text is formed in terms of grammar constructions. So, as now we know a little bit of theory, uh, maybe we can do something uh, simple, something basic. Let's start from arithmetic expressions. Uh, let's try to implement a little parser for arithmetic expressions format of the numbers and uh, subtractions. Uh, yeah, just to really simplify our first step. Uh, before we continue, uh, we first probably should agree on uh, what will be the answer of this arithmetic expression. Uh, I let you <laughs> compute. That, that's minus one, yeah. Okay. We, we so, this. Nicolai, could you write uh, grammar for this? Okay, let's start the grammar. So, what we have here is an expression and we want to do subtraction, so basically we subtract two expressions here. So we have the expression is an expression minus another expression, and expression can be a terminal and a number, so then we have it. So we can generate the, the tree <coughs> uh, based on this. So this is the expression minus blah, 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 minus one, and we construct the tree here, and we have it. But hold on, hold on. Actually, I can see this as okay. This is the first expression minus the number, or I can see it the other way. In fact, I can see it like this is a number minus another expression. So I have another tree. So basically, based on the same input, I can actually have two results. And well, I, given that arithmetic is a, is used a lot in banks. Uh, and your, and your accounts, I don't think it's fair to have different answers on arithmetic, so this is probably wrong. Yeah, and it, uh, this problem called uh, ambiguity, some grammars are ambiguous uh, for the same uh, text, they can produce you two different interpretations, and okay, computers are precise machines, they use in banks, and it's, they don't like ambiguities. So, in grammars, uh, we need uh, 
to have a way to solve this in parsers. Uh, and there is a way to solve this. Uh, you can have uh, another form of grammar on top. Uh, this is uh, what is called left recursive grammar, where uh, non the same non-terminal appears immediately on the right-hand side. Uh, those grammars, uh, they, uh, they're perfectly suitable for uh, building of, uh, let's say, left associative trees, so for left associativity of operators, so exactly for a correct case. And at the bottom you see uh, what's called uh, uh, right recursive grammar, when, when non-terminal obviously comes on the rightmost position on the right-hand side, and they, they're suitable for right associativity, and uh, they give you an ambiguous result. So obviously we don't want uh, the, uh, to use uh, the last one. We are going to use uh, uh, the first one. Uh, given the correct grammar, maybe you can write uh, some code. Okay, so now I have the correct grammar. I can write the code. So just one trick here. Uh, I will have a method for non-terminal, and the, the big trick is, okay, if I write it exactly like this, then I will have a method expression that will first call an expression method and I will have a recursivity that cannot be solved. So that's why, in fact, I tweak a little bit the grammar to use repetitions. And, well, this is the code actually. Well, I have this expression method that will first have a number, and while the token is minus, then it's r minus the number, and then I return the result. Cool, there you have it. You can compute an important arithmetic expression. Well, it's a subtraction right now. Yeah, it seems correct. Okay, let's complicate a little bit. Uh, let's have also multiplications in addition to subtractions. Uh, we again need to agree on what should be the result of this. Uh, three times two. What is that? <laughs> yeah, this is test uh, also. Okay, minus two. Cool. Uh, can you write grammar for this? You already learned that something. Okay, let's go. Let's write the grammar. So multiplication is also less associative, so this is basically the same problem, so I use the same solution. Like expression minus number, or it's an expression times a number, or it's a number. Um, Bad. Yeah, yes. Excuse me, Nicola, but uh, we have a problem here. What? <laughs> um, if we start uh, from the right, uh, we see that uh, this expression, uh, it can uh, match only this alternative, whereas the number is the last one, uh, and multiplication just before. Then, uh, okay, we have another expression, this one, which is, uh, matches the first alternative, and okay, number minus number. And so if we uh, parse it uh, like this, we are going to have uh, Wrong result. We agreed that this should be minus, minus two, two, but it's still. Uh, okay, let me help you a little bit. Let me fix this. In order to solve this problem, a common trick is uh, to uh, represent uh, priority of operators by introduction of more non terminals. So we will have uh, now instead of one non terminal in our grammar, we will have two one for subtractions and another for multiplications. Uh, the highest priority should go in our grammar uh, at the lowest level, so multiplication has the highest priority, it goes on the lowest level. And voila, we will have a correct result. So, can you implement uh, something? Yeah, so now I have the correct grammar, priority is encoded in the grammar, so now I can write as previously. Uh, a, a method by non terminal, so I have the multiplication with uh, I take numbers and so on, and I have on the other side the subtraction when I will take multiplication, and while I have the can minus, I will just continue on it. Et voila! <laughs> yeah, it seems correct. Uh, so, indeed, uh, this is uh, a basic uh, calculator for arithmetic expression. Uh, it's called uh, recursive one because it has uh, recursive calls. And actually, let me congratulate you. Uh, 
let's say you just invented what is uh, well known uh, for quite a long time. Uh, we invented what is called uh, LL1 grammars, uh, LL1 uh, parsers. Uh, so there is plenty of parser generators uh, which uh, for LL1 grammars uh, able to generate uh, code for parsing. Uh, it's called uh, LL1 because uh, it goes from left. Uh, they use, uh, as we used, uh, they use uh, one token look ahead, so they look ahead uh, to make a decision on a following token to decide which alternative to pick. Um, as we saw, they have some troubles with uh, left recursive uh, uh, rules, which uh, describe left associativity. We needed to uh, tweak a little bit the code uh, to get rid of uh, left recursion, to replace it on repetition. As we saw, uh, there is uh, troubles with some ambiguities, so such uh, parser generators, they are not able to deal with uh, ambiguous grammars, and LL1 grammars, they are not ambiguous. And as we are able to write uh, some code uh, by hand, uh, such grammars are quite trivial for conversion. Um, so, uh, we learned a little bit. Uh, Probably uh, we can move uh, to something uh, bigger than just arithmetic expression. Yeah, on, do, you want, yeah. do you want to continue with your Java parser? Yeah, go on with Java parser. Okay, let's take uh, a part of, uh, the, of the Java language. So uh, it's, it's oversimplified, but that's a part of it. So what we have here is expression method code and assignment. So um, basically, uh, what we have is qualified ID is an identifier dot something else, dot qualified ID and so on. And so, expression can be um, uh, can be a qualified ID, a method call which is a qualified ID with parentheses, or uh, and an assign or an assignment which can be a qualified ID followed by plus some expression. Okay. And we will continue as we, we were doing before. I will write an, uh, a method by a uh, non-terminal because that's what we, are. we were doing it in, in progress. But then there's a trouble. How can I make a choice in my methods to know if the expression should be um, uh, should be a qualified ID, a method call, or an assignment? Because all three start with a qualified ID, in fact. So I, I won't be able in my code to, to choose the right alternative of the grammar and to identify which construction of the language I'm currently working on. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there is an issue if uh, ID is a token, then indeed an expression. Uh, using one token look ahead, we can't uh, make a choice. And uh, of course, uh, there is a solution. And uh, a little one way of solving this problem is again to change uh, your grammar uh, to make it a little one. Uh, to get rid of this problem of choice. So, what we're doing here is called uh, left factorization. You factorize common parts of alternatives, and you move it uh, on upper level. So here we factorize uh, qualified ID and move it directly to the expression. And then in uh, expression, uh, in, in, in factored expression, we have uh, an easy choice uh, or it's uh, nothing, or it's method call, or assignment, and uh, those three they start from uh, different uh, ter uh, terminals tokens, so we can make a choice. And, yeah, and for this one, uh, we can write the parser. Okay, so then I can write the code, and uh, same as previously. Uh, method for non-terminal, so for expression, uh, I will just take the example of expression here, but so expression, same as previous, is a qualified ID, even on what you actually factorized. Then if the token is a parenthesis, then it's a method call. Then if the next token is equal, then it's an assignment. And otherwise, it's a field access, so basically an uh, uh, expression. And so I, I can write the code because you factorized to allow one way, and then I have it. 
but the problem is that in fact this works well for the small part, but in reality this leads to some mess in uh, in some in, in direct parser. If you if you continue to work on other one, then the problem is that when you add construction, you will have to actually do some tricks, do some acts around to actually factorize the grammar. And if you write it by hand, it's going to be maintenance L on the on the parser, and that's basically what what's in the JavaScript parser and JDK eight. It's like, okay, because of introduction of um, uh, annotation on type, there are some ambiguities with uh, one token occurred, so there are some factorization to be done and so on, and this leads to this huge, this is only comment, <laughs> to this huge comment in the, in the JavaScript parser. Yeah, overall parser, I think it's more than uh, thousands of lines of uh, handwritten code with uh, huge comments like this one, taking more than 20 lines just just to explain, okay, what's going here? And, and that's a nightmare to maintain. Um, and uh, coming back to the question posed before, uh, there was a claimant that uh, in Java 7 specifications they had two grammars, in Java 8 uh, they had uh, just one. Uh, what happened and why? Um, prior to Java 8, they were maintaining uh, two grammars. One is uh, let's say suitable for human reading, uh, it's easily understandable. And another one, they had it in a summary, uh, more suitable for uh, writing uh, the parser by hands or for usage of uh, parser generators like level one. Uh, and so with, indeed with introduction of Java 8, uh, it started to be really hard to maintain a sync between those two, one to explain language and another one to implement the parser. So they basically said, okay, we don't care anymore about uh, factor version. Let's drop it. And starting from Java language specification 8, you won't have uh, a one suitable for parser, parser generators. Um, so summarizing on handwritten parsers, uh, like one in JavaC or in, uh, I don't know, GCC uh, or in uh, CLang. Uh, most of them, they base it on uh, grammars uh, pretty close to LL1. Uh, why? Because uh, it's easy to, for, for humans writing those uh, parsers, it's easy to also operate with one token look ahead to make decisions. Uh, those parsers, uh, why is they handwritten? Because uh, in case when, when you don't have generated code, you, you control everything. You can add uh, precise your reporting saying, <coughs> okay, here probably uh, you expect a semicolon uh, or, I don't know, open parenthesis. And you can try to recover from those errors. Uh, you can assume that actually the semicolon is in place and uh, your parser can continue. Whereas parser generators, they usually have troubles with uh, your reporting or recovery. They give you a, a massive uh, output say, saying, okay, something wrong with parsing, but uh, you don't know what, and uh, they usually lack automatic error recovery. Also, handwritten parsers, they of course optimize it for performances because again, you control uh, your code, so you don't have something generated non-optimal. But uh, as a drawback, uh, such uh, parsers, they, their maintenance health, they're huge, uh, they're not easily understandable, and so on. Um, Coming back a little bit uh, to LL1 parser generators and uh, tools based on LL1 grammars. Uh, they're not really practical. Okay, they're suitable for basic examples like arithmetic expressions, but for something real, uh, for real uh, languages like even for Java, uh, they require measure or refactorings of your formal grammar. You can't just take a specification, drop it on your parser generator and uh, so that he will give you a parser. No, you can't. You first need to tweak uh, your grammar, as we showed. But uh, still, there are some nice tools like uh, Java CC, which uh, 
which let's say contains some steroids, uh, they can do more than one token look ahead. Uh, they have uh, ability to declare precedence. So they are usable for real languages, but still it's not copy-paste of grammar. It will require you to declare something in addition to, to handle your language. Okay, so uh, what you say is LL1 is kind of complicated to maintain with the continuity and so on, so maybe what you can do is not try to use the factorized grammar you proposed me, but the previous one, and then let's just try alternative, and if it doesn't match, then we come back and we try another one, until we get one that match and we make the correct decision. So that's why I, what I coded here. Um, so basically, an expression, well, let's try if it's a qualified ID. Okay, if it's not, let's just try if it's a method call. Well, if it's not, let's just try if, it, if it's a, an it should be an assignment. And we should match. Ta-da! Nice idea, Nicola, but I think ID is okay. But uh, sorry, you again got it wrong. We say it's that uh, both method call and assignment, they could start from qualified ID. So actually, each time you're going to try uh, this first alternative, uh, you're going to succeed and you will never... Uh, this is a dead code. But uh, it, it's okay. Mistakes are okay. We learn. So, qualified ID here is a problem, but uh, we can easily solve this problem by moving it uh, to the lowest level. So first we try assignments, and if it uh, doesn't uh, match uh, text input doesn't match uh, grammars and we try uh, method call and finally qualified ID. And uh, this is probably going to work and uh, it is going to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be in fact. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me congratulate you again. What we just, uh, let's say, invented, uh, it's uh, again well known. Uh, it's known as uh, parsing expression grammars. Um, in fact, uh, they, they're known uh, back to the really old dates, but uh, they was not uh, that popular. Uh, they started to be popular in 2002. Uh, introduced, by, uh, introduced and formalized by Brian Ford, uh, who is going to move actually in EPFL, Geneva University, soon. Uh, this guy proposed, uh, okay, in our formal grammars, uh, let's uh, use uh, ordered choice instead of unordered, instead of just plain alternative. alternatives. So let's use another operator, which is an ordered choice. Then, uh, indeed, uh, we will use the principle of backtracking, uh, try, fail, try, fail. And uh, it turned out that, uh, on practice, this works quite well for many programming languages, for grammars of programming languages. Uh, okay, there is still some troubles, like, uh, again, no support of left recursion. Uh, our uh, parsers still recursive ones, so they can't handle infinite recursion. recursion. Order a choice. Uh, it always will choose uh, something. Basically, it's going to choose the first successful alternative. So again, uh, those parser generators, they don't like uh, ambiguous grammars. Uh, but it should be OK, because uh, most programming languages, uh, they're not ambiguous. If, if they would be ambiguous, it's a nightmare for developers to use them. And it turned out that uh, such parsers uh, it's uh, quite trivial to implement them uh, by hands or even uh, in parser generators to generate some code. You just indeed create one method per non-terminal, you try all, all alternatives and you don't. Um, of course, backtracking implies uh, some uh, problems. Uh, what if you uh, are going to try and fail too much, but there is a well-known technique uh, to avoid this. Uh, they call it memoization. You can remember uh, results of previous attempts and to not uh, redo the computation again. Uh, on practice, uh, if you talk about uh, sonar source uh, and our parsers, they all base it on this theory. They all base it on parsing expression grammars. It turned out that uh, 
with this technology, we're able to cover uh, most languages, uh, Java, COBOL, PLC, Coral, uh, ABAP, uh, JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, uh, pretty much everything. Uh, during this process of uh, usage of parsing expression grammars, we see that uh, our final grammars uh, they are not that much different from the ones uh, given in Java language specification. Oh, sorry, in language specification. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, specifications are created by humans, and uh, somehow, naturally, uh, humans write uh, something which is easy to read, and parsing expression grammars is exactly uh, this way. But uh, at some moment of time, at Sonar Source, uh, we uh, decided that uh, we need to go in a C, C++ world. We tried with, uh, let's say, a lot one approach, with person expression grammars, uh, and we failed because uh, uh, C, C++ language is ambiguous. We're going to see next uh, uh, why uh, and how we solve this issue. But uh, non uh, parsing expression grammars, non LL1, they don't help. It, it is dead end. What is that, Nicola? Um, so this is uh, the DSL we actually use uh, internally as an source to, uh, to, uh, to express. Uh, well, it, it has evolved in fact recently. <laughs> this is a trick. But anyway, um, this is the DSL of that allowed uh, the implementation of uh, PEG uh, parsing expression grammar uh, from the source. And this is the DSL we use internally to parse all the languages, uh, most of the languages we cover. So uh, basically, we we express or or. The, the grammar of the languages with this DSL, you get the abstract tree and write rules for your enjoyment. Um, and, uh, and well, then it's really, it, it generates all the parsing and uh, the abstract tree uh, to, to write the rules. Yeah, uh, just to add here uh, and answering on the question do we use uh, parser generators uh, at Sonar Source or not and why? Uh, we don't use parser generators, we don't like generated code. Uh, we like uh, the code which is descriptive but uh, not generated. That's why we have a domain specific language to describe grammars. On the other side, uh, we are quite uh, lazy. Uh, that's why we... Go to Prescott. That's why we don't want uh, to maintain something handwritten. We want uh, rapid uh, development life cycle. If we need uh, some tweak uh, for support of, I don't know, Java 8 or Java 9, we should be able to do this quickly. And that's, again, why we have uh, a way to express, just express grammar and use this uh, expression instead of maintaining something handwritten. So, is it a story? Um, I guess it's time for a break. Uh, you're tired. Uh, yeah, you had uh, took too much beers yesterday? Yeah. Well, not yesterday, but... <laughs> okay. You want a break? You have a break? Okay, let's, let's have a small break. And a small quiz. Can you tell me what this actually... what this Java program is going to print out? Who thinks that it's uh, foo? Okay. Uh -huh. Who thinks that it's uh, bar? Okay. Who thinks that it's not foo and not bar? Ah, cool. Wow. Half, half. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you explain. <laughs> this is the one problem of the tangling else. Uh, of the tangling else. The problem is to know where is the else actually. Uh, Attach to, to which if in, the, in this case. Mm -hmm. So indentation was a little bit tricky. But so here, uh, the rule in the, in the Java grammar is to say that uh, the, the damning else is attached to the uh, closest if. So in this case, mm -hmm. it will be attached to the second if, which means the statement 
after the first if is the second if, which means that it will never be executed because of the first, and it will be nothing else. Mm -hmm. And well, this is um, uh, this is known in the, in the in the language specification, and we can actually with Peg we can actually encode that into the grammar. And this is what actually is shown here: is that an if statement is an if condition with an else statement, or an if condition with a statement. And so when we will parse this uh, bit of code, we will actually parse this first if with its else, consume it, and then consume the second if with the statement, with the second statement. Yeah, uh, so this is a nice example, call it and it's done in else. It exists in, uh, let's say, many languages, not in all, but in many. And uh, this actually shows that uh, grammars for many languages are naturally ambiguous uh, because of this. And uh, th they all have uh, dangling cause ambiguity. And uh, this shows why uh, you need some additional tricks to handle that. Um, what else? Yeah, and Beck, with uh, his uh, order of choice, solves this problem just naturally. You, you put uh, uh, alternatives in correct order and you receive uh, correct interpretation. Okay, uh, do you have enough rest? Can we yeah, that, move that's forward? Okay. We can go. Okay. Um, another little quiz. Um, let's imagine I give you some uh, big program and uh, Let's say I hide everything except uh, a little tiny part, and you know that this is a, a Java code for sure. So, could you tell me what is that? Any ideas? Just imagine we have uh, just hided some characters around, we just made a big zoom around the program. Mm -hmm. What can this be in Java? Yes. Some other ideas? What? No. Uh, I don't see how. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. You can have some more things, but basically this ah, is okay. a multiplication. You write indeed uh, here if we hide it, uh, some name, it could be uh, method call but again multiplied by b. So Java is awesome. Uh, Java doesn't uh, allow you to interpret uh, something uh, in an ambiguous way. E even such a s simple thing has a single interpretation. It is a multiplication. No doubt about this. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, yeah. Um, OK, there is a little trick. Uh, Identifiers, uppercase, this is not a very good uh, Java style. It's probably cut of Nicola, but again, we all do mistakes. It's fine. Yeah, I don't uh, have an issue for this. <laughs> yeah. But Java is really cool uh, because it doesn't allow you uh, multiple inter interpretations of the same thing. What about C++? In C++, we have an issue. We have a huge issue because Exactly the same construction which we showed before in Java, in C++, in multiple different contexts, will have absolutely different interpretations, depending on what happened uh, before. Uh, if A and B is uh, integer variables, then okay, it's multiplication. But if uh, for some reason A uh, was declared as a type, and B was declared as a pointer, uh, the same construction turns into cast uh, to some type and uh, the reference of uh, pointer. No more multiplication. And uh, yeah, this is just a teeny example of uh, yeah, but ambiguity come in there. But come on, we have, as I said, we can solve this. Hold on. <laughs> Let me finish a little bit. Uh, this is uh, just one example of ambiguity in C++. Uh, whereas uh, we uh, working on C++, we found something like already 150 uh, different cases of uh, ambiguous constructions. 
this is just uh, enormous. But looks like Nikolai was yeah, really so eager idea. to write a parser for C++. Oh, we have SSL, we can solve this. Go on. Okay, so using SSLR, we say, okay, we have a Hanabi expression, which is a sequence of type, and the primary is the, and the multiplication. So it's, we have the multiplication, this an array with an array. An array is what is eventually a typecast, and then the primary can wait. Hold on. The problem here uh, is that it doesn't matter on which way I order all this, I will never be able to reach the other one. I mean, it's like when I will be parsing things, I will consume the first thing, but I won't know if it's the correct one or not. So how can, in fact, I choose the correct attempt? Yeah, you see that it's not the easiest. Ah, yeah, it's not but easy, in fact. Okay, and it, the problem here is that in order to distinguish between uh, those two uh, alternatives of uh, unary operator, you need to know in advance whether something is identifier of a type or just a plain identifier. And uh, let's say this is a chicken and egg problem. Uh, in order to uh, parse, uh, you need to know in advance what is what. And uh, to know this, you need to do uh, what is called semantic analysis. You need to understand that, okay, this is a type, this is a variable, uh, this is an expression of a given type, and so on. And in order to do semantic analysis, you would actually prefer to parse before, to simplify work of semantic analysis. So, to parse, you need to parse, uh, and... Uh, so to parse, I need semantic, but to for semantic, I need to parse. Yeah, chicken and egg, what to do first. And uh, handwritten compilers like GCC or CLang, uh, yeah, for C, C++ or, I don't know, Intel compiler based on EDG. Uh, they do uh, a lot of tricks around those problems. Uh, that's why they grow inside even fusers and uh, Java compiler. Uh, they need to have uh, some tentative parsing. They consume some constructions, assuming that, uh, okay, for the time being, we don't know what is that. Uh, when we will know, we will come back and uh, reparse it. Uh, it is a nightmare to, to uh, write by hands or even to, to put it in your mind and to imagine how this is, uh, can be handled. Uh, and uh, that's why at Sonar Source uh, we decided to not go this way, to not try to, to, to imply some tricks, even if those tricks are well known. Uh, we wanted something which, which just works. You, you give a grammar, it gives you a result. And okay, in this case, uh, the result uh, is not uh, a single parse tree, is not a single interpretation. In this case, it is multiple interpretations, but we'd like to see them all. And then when we have all the possible interpretation in a nice tree structure, we can apply on top semantic analysis and then just say, okay, this uh, alternative is correct and this is not correct. But we don't need to have uh, any tricks inside of parsers. This is completely separate task. It's, it's, it will be purely uh, semantic analysis. Um, okay, so how we solve this? And in fact, this is not that hard uh, as, as it sounds. And in fact, it, it, it was pretty well known uh, since a very long time. It's, uh, it's called generalized parsers. They able to handle any kind of grammar, ambiguous or not, left recursive or not, right recursive or not, and so on. And the first one was called Early, uh, back to 1968. Um, while it works, uh, it has enormous uh, time complexity. It's super slow, so it was not practically usable for for real programming languages, uh, real source code, because it's, it's slow. And that's why it's not uh, used by uh, real compilers. Then, okay, time goes on. At some moment of time, uh, GLR comes on stage. Uh, it's uh, much faster than early. 
uh, it has uh, it had uh, still some issues about uh, time, but uh, those were resolved. And the only issue which uh, remains is that uh, this one is complex to implement. It, uh, it computes uh, massive uh, uh, parsing tables. Uh, when it fails to parse something, it gives you a huge stack trace uh, of uh, non-understandable uh, constructions and so on. <coughs> and then, quite recently, uh, first publication was done in in 2010, uh, GLL uh, comes on stage, and uh, this is quite uh, recent uh, technology. Um, it is uh, yeah, 2010. Uh, it is generalized parser. It doesn't leave any grammar uh, behind. It can handle any type of grammar. It's much simpler in implementation than GLR. It's in fact uh, not uh, much different from what we saw for LL1, uh, with just uh, some additional tricks uh, to handle ambiguities and left recursion. Uh, it's obviously faster than earlier. Um, and uh, so far, <coughs> let's say till today or maybe tomorrow, uh, there is not much uh, tools implementing uh, this kind of parsers. Uh, but this is going to change. Um, when do you do your push, in fact? <laughs> Hold on. <coughs> um, so, at Sonar Source, we tried uh, this technology for CC, and it worked. And it's, uh, not worked, it works. It works quite well. We see that it has uh, reasonable performances compared to. Uh, real uh, compilers. It is, uh, in our opinion, the only clean choice for C++ because uh, separation of concepts is, is a great thing. You just separate parsing from semantic analysis and the rest. Uh, if we can't implement full semantic analysis uh, for C++ from the beginning, we don't need to. We can do this incrementally. Uh, we already have some tree and we can detect uh, some patterns on this tree, even if some parts of this tree is known to be ambiguous. Um, and I say that this is an only, uh, there is only academic tools for now because uh, we are going to open source uh, this uh, implementation. Uh, Nicola points out that, okay, I just need to do a git push. Uh, that's kind of true, but uh, I don't think we have time to do this right now. I will do this uh, maybe in train or tomorrow. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so let's, let's, let's talk about this. Of course, uh, such... Uh, Parsers, uh, they bring back uh, some already solved by tech or by other parsers problems. Like they return this uh, dumbling else problem uh, because it is ambiguity. Uh, this ambiguity will give us uh, a critic raised tree uh, where uh, outer if statement uh, can have multiple interpretations, one uh, with uh, them and other with without, uh, one with them and else, and other just with them. But uh, on practice, this is not uh, the big issue. Uh, having this tree, uh, doing a simple pattern matching, you can easily understand which alternative to reject. Uh, you reject and you leave uh, on the correct one. Um, um, so, to sum up, uh, we saw what is LL1. Uh, majority of tools based on, on this. Uh, we saw what is handwritten and, uh, and we saw what is spec and uh, generalized parsers. And to summarize, uh, parsing is not at all a solved uh, problem. You see that there is uh, Publications come and given nowadays, even if uh, tools were uh, known for a very long time. And uh, there is actually no silver bullet. Uh, 
you want a performance, you probably can write your parser. Uh, you want a, a rapid development cycle, you probably gonna go uh, sonar source way, uh, trying to adopt uh, some formal uh, theories and uh, tools based on formalism. And that's it.